Welcome everyone. We're just going to wait um, just a minute or two just to make sure that everyone um, is able to join. So thanks for coming out this evening. Welcome everyone. We're just gonna wait a minute or two just for, for people to join, but thank you so much for, for joining us this evening. Just waiting um, just a little bit longer just to see if there's anyone else um, waiting to come in and join us this evening. Well, perfect. I'm going to just kick off myself and, and just my, my name is uh, Aoife Braslin and I'm the Communications and Marketing Manager for Sims IVF. Just a little about Sims IVF. So um, we actually have six location sites. So we are three main clinics. We have one in Swords, we have one in Klonski, which is just South Dublin, Dundrum area. We have one down in Cork. And then we have satellite clinics, which is clinics where you can kind of get your bloods and scans done during your cycle. So we have one in Carlow, We've one in Limerick and we've one in Dundalk. So those are six locations. And um, we're part of Virtus Health, which is a, a global fertility provider. And um, so we have a great network of support. Um, and yeah, if you have any questions or anything like that, there's a Q&A down at the bottom there. And what we'll do is we'll go through them at the end. So just pop them in during the talk, if anything kind of comes through and we'll, we'll answer it then. So I'm gonna hand it over to Mandy Leslie, who is our lab manager in the SWORDS clinic. And um, thanks, Mandy, for coming out tonight. And um, I'll hand it over to you. Great, thank you very much. Yeah, just bear with me a minute here while I figure out the screen sharing scenario. And then we'll go from there. Okay. Right, can everybody see that? Ethan, yeah, we can you see, see that? It. Yeah, we can see it, Mandy. Super. Okay. So thank you to everyone for coming. Um, I'd like to welcome you to the lab in SimSwords. So we'll give you a quick overview of the team um, before we, oh, sorry, what's going on here? Sorry now, can you still see me? Yeah, we can still see you, just it's skipped on. messing around now sorry now share again sorry i'm having issues here there we go there we go apologies everybody so this is, if it moves for me, come on, there, okay, so welcome everybody, apologies for all that. So this is the new lab, uh, lab in embryology in SimSwords. So we'll give you a quick overview of the lab team first and introduce ourselves. So at the moment, there are eight of us in total. Um, so we have a lab manager, a deputy manager, three senior embryologists, and uh, one almost trained embryologist and two trainees. So between us, there are nearly 70 years of embryology experience within the lab. So our job is unique in that we play a big part in the IVF cycles that come through the clinic, but you really get to see us. So today, all that's gonna to change and all the pictures and videos in the presentation are our own staff. 
because unfortunately we had no models available for the making of the presentation. So here is the door to the lab and please come in. So if you're coming through to us for a treatment cycle, the first time you see us will be through one of the theatre hatches at the egg collection. So here's the theatre hatch, there's a little door in the, in the wall, and we will open that up and one of the embryology team will greet you and perform an ID check. So you'll be asked your full name, your date of birth, and also if you're coming through for treatment with a partner, your partner's name and date of birth as well. So then we show you an ID card. Now this ID card will contain information to identify you within the laboratory and it becomes important in a minute. So we will confirm a few things with you and your doctor as well, such as the method of fertilization we're going to use, um, if there's any other important pieces of information we need to know about the cycle. And after that, we'll give you some privacy while the doctor administers your sedation and gets you ready for the egg collection. So the hatch door again will close and we'll give you a few minutes. So while that's happening in theatre with yourselves and the doctor, what we're doing in the lab is retrieving some warm dishes from an incubator. So the dishes will come into the incubator. So this is our crib here and it has a microscope attached to it. So we put the dishes into the incubator and we use the card that you've just seen and we activate your profile on our electronic witnessing system. So every time we assign a dish to your name or remove anything from one dish or tube to another, we use a, what we call a double ID check. So this involves two embryologists. The first one reads the name and the date of birth and the patient number from all the dishes and the tubes that we're about to use. And the second embryologist has the paperwork in front of them and reads back the information from the paperwork. So we're confirming that we have the right patient and the right partner. So our electronic witnessing system is used as a backup and it electronically ensures that we have the right patient and the right partner. And it creates a record of who performed the procedure and puts a timestamp on everything that we do. So once the end collection starts, the theater hatch will reopen and we'll, we'll retrieve the tubes containing follicular fluid. So this down here are tubes of follicular fluid. So we take that fluid, put it inside our crib here with the microscope attached. We tip the fluid into a dish and then we carefully search around in the dish through the microscope and find all the eggs. So we pop those eggs then into a separate dish. So this is a dish here containing warm media. So that's fluid that helps uh, to grow and feed eggs and embryos. So we collect all the eggs in there and you can actually see them. If you can see in the middle here, there's little white spots. So that uh, they are the eggs that are in the middle of the dish. And those, if you focus in, if you put the microscope to focus in on those eggs, this is what you're actually looking at at the bottom here. So this is an egg in the middle here. And all the other cells around the outside, that's called the cumulus, so the cloud, and they help to protect the egg and feed the egg while it's in the follicle. So the next page. So once we've collected all your eggs, your partner, if you're having treatment with a partner, is requested to supply us with a sperm sample. So he'll be shown into a collection room. He'll be given um, a, a pot and asked to bring it back to the laboratory when he's finished. So if you're having an egg cycle, obviously we'll skip this bit. And if we have um, patients going through donor sperm cycles, we will already, ha already have the donor sperm in the laboratory at that point. So once we retrieve the sperm sample, we do an initial assessment. <clears throat> so what we're looking for is three different things. The concentration of sperm, so how many there are. The motility of the sperms, so that's how well they're moving. And the morphology of the sperms, so that's how nice they are to look at. So this picture shows a few variations of sperm morphology down the bottom here. So all these are typical of human sperm, and it's only the very first one that is actually considered normal. So the vast majority of human sperm is actually abnormal looking, and anything over 4%, just 4%, is considered a normal sample. So if there are plenty of sperm like this first video, and they're moving well, the usual treatment would be IVF. So if there's a lower number of sperm like the second video, then the usual treatment would be ICSI. And we'll get to the difference between those two in a minute. So at this point, when we've got the sperm sample, we would usually put the, the sperm sample over what we call a gradient. Now the gradient acts as a two-step filter. And what we can see down the bottom here, these two little orange parts are two different dilutions, two different concentrations of this gradient. And we've got semen sitting at the top. So then we put that in the centrifuge, spin it down for 20 minutes, 
And what that does is it filters out all the good sperm from all the other sperm, all the other cells, all the other seminal plasma. So what you're left with at the bottom is the good quality sperm. This is the rest the remainder of the gradient here and the remainder of the semen so, uh, sample that we have on the top. So once we've filtered out the good sperm, we count them again to make sure we've got an appropriate concentration and then we place them into an incubator for the afternoon. So inseminations are always done in the afternoon because the signs of fertilization are only around, are best seen, I suppose, around 18 hours post insemination. So our embryologists are very fussy and they don't want to be coming in and doing the fertilization checks at three in the morning. So our in, uh, inseminations are always done in the afternoon. So for an IVF cycle, all we're doing is we're adding good quality sperm to the dish of eggs that we collected earlier, and then they're placing them back in the incubator to fertilize overnight. So for an IVF cycle, we can usually have around 10 eggs in a dish, and we add in about 150,000 sperm to them. So IVF fertilization rates with good quality sperm sit around 60-ish percent on average, and that depends on egg quality. So, the other method of fertilization is called ICSI, oh, sorry, insem insemination is called ICSI, and this stands for intracytoplasmic sperm injection, which basically means that we're injecting a single sperm into each of the mature eggs. So an ICSI cycle is more invasive than just an IVF cycle where we just leave them to fertilize themselves. So the eggs, when we collected them, there was a little picture you saw that there was a cumulus, a cloud around the egg. So for an ICSI cycle, we actually need to remove those cells for us to get a good look at the egg itself. So all the mature eggs can be injected with a single sperm. And we know that this egg here is mature because of the presence of this little cell at the top. So this shows us that the egg has gone through its final maturation process and it's ready to receive sperm. So the, the maturation process was triggered to continue by the trigger injection that was given to the patient just before their egg collection. So when we've got the eggs ready to go, first we need to pick a good looking sperm. So if this video will play for us. So the first thing we're going to do with this sperm, we're going to swipe at its tail and that stops it moving. And we do that for two reasons. The first reason is it releases activation factors which help to start the process of fertilization within the egg. And the second reason is it makes it easy for us to catch. So once we've collected our sperm, there he goes. Sorry, I'll pause that one and we'll start this one. So once we've collected our sperm, we go into the drop where all the eggs are. And we use some gentle suction to hold the egg in place. So this is holding the egg in place. Just a little bit of gentle suction and that's um, so that when we inject it, it doesn't move. So you can see the sperm coming down, being pushed into the egg. What we're gonna do, we're gonna suck back a little bit on the membrane to make sure that the membrane breaks. There it goes. And then the sperm goes back into the egg. Nice and slowly. And then the pipette containing the sperm is now removed. And then the sperm is now in the egg. And then we're going to leave that, embryo, that egg to fertilize overnight and check it in the morning. So fertilization rates with Dixie are typically higher at around 70% because we know that we're putting a sperm directly into each of the eggs and that bypasses some of the reasons why eggs might not fertilize. Um, the ICSI cycle is obviously more invasive because we're sticking a needle into an egg and we do run the risk of the egg degenerating, um, which is why we go to great lengths to train our embryologists at this technique before we let them loose on patient material. So the next morning, which we would refer to as day one, we're checking for fertilization. And what we want to see is the presence of these two little disc shapes. So you can see one here and another one here. So these little disc shapes are what we call pronuclei. So the two pronuclei show us that the egg is normally fertilized. So anything more or less is abnormal and won't be used any further. So you can see over here, we've got three, one, two, three, and this one down here just has a single one. So once we complete the fertilization check, we usually call the patient um, to let them know how many eggs are fertilized and will then be continuing their journey within the laboratory. So at this point, many of the patients choose to avail of, of the embryoscope. So the embryoscope is an incubator with a camera inside 
and it takes a picture of each embryo every 20 minutes and it shows us how well the embryo is developing over the next few days. So this is our embryoscope right here, this little blue thing. And it's a great training and decision-making tool. So firstly, the machine acts as an incubator. It keeps the embryos at a constant 37 degrees. It provides them with oxygen, with carbon dioxide, and that helps to create optimum conditions for the growth of the embryos over the next few days. But secondly, the embryoscope takes a picture every 20 minutes, and then it's able to create a video from those pictures to show us exactly how the embryo behaves. So we place the fertilized eggs into a special dish, which is up here in the corner. So this little dish has got some wells in it. So there's actually eight on this side and eight on this side. So a total of 16 eggs can be put into this dish and then put into the embryoscope. And we can watch the magic happen without even having to disturb these embryos. So the camera now knows where each of those little wells are located within that dish and can take a photograph of them directly. So we get images like these. So what we're looking at here is an embryo developing over the next five days. So these little bubbles that you can see in here, these are the cells. Okay, one, two, and they're surrounded by a jelly shell. So what we want to see are nice even sized cells. We want to see no fragmentation or minimal fragmentation. So a little bit of fragmentation would be little bits here, the tiny little blebs. Um, and we want to see appropriate cell numbers for each day of development. So we want to see two to four cells would be around day two of development. Between sort of eight and 12 cells would be day three. We want to see the embryo compacting on day four. And that's the embryo organizing itself into the blastocyst structure that we want to see for day five. So without an embryoscope, these would be the usual time periods we would be taking the embryo out of the incubator to observe them and then putting them back in. But when we have an embryoscope, this is what we get. So if I can play this video for you. So this shows us an, a series of three embryos from the fertilization check until day five of development. So we use these videos to help us choose the best embryo out of the group. We can see exactly which time the embryo divides and if they divide evenly or if one embryo is excluding some cells. The time points are important because we know that, for example, an embryo which divides into two cells before 24 hours has a much better chance of forming a pregnancy than an embryo that takes more than 30 hours to divide. So this helps make the decisions as to which would be the best embryo for transfer or which would be the best embryos to be frozen. Um, it's also a very good training tool for our trainee embryologists to actually see how embryos divide and they become aware of why that's important. So the trainees spend hundreds of hours watching videos like these and it takes over two years to produce a fully trained embryologist. So I will just stop that there. I could watch these all day. <laughs> So most patients who are having an IVF or an ICSI cycle will have a blastocyst freeze or a transfer. So I'd like to talk a little bit about a few things that we look for when we're grading the blastocyst to decide which is the best one. So the first thing we're looking for is expansion. So the embryo, you can see here, is surrounded by the jelly shell. So the shell is called a zona and it's protecting the embryo while it's fertilizing and while it's growing. So during early development, the zona is quite thick. So when the blastocyst starts to expand, it starts to thin out that shell. And this is the embryo preparing for the hatching process. So it needs to crack that shell open and hatch outside. And once it does that, it's able to attach to the uterine lining. So the first thing we're looking for is expansion. It's graded by a number one through six, with one being only just starting to form a blastocyst and six being completely hatched out of the shell. So the second thing we look for is a population of cells called the inner cell mass. And you can see the inner cell mass is this population of cells here, okay? So the inner cell mass is the bit that makes the baby and it's graded A, B or C with A being the top grade. And the third thing we look for is a population of cells called the trophectoderm. Now the trophectoderm is this part of the embryo. I can get my cursor reckon. This part of the embryo here all around the outside. And that's the population of cells which makes the placenta and all the extra membranes that go into creating the pregnancy. So the trophectoderm is also graded A, B or C with A being the top grade. 
So when we discuss embryo quality with you at your transfer or your freeze call, and we tell you the grade of the embryo was a 3AA or a 4BA or anything like that, this is how we're determining the quality. The first one is expansion, the second one is the inner cell mass quality, and the third one is trajectogen quality. So all being well, the next time you actually see us in person is during a transfer. So again, we would appear through the hatch window uh, and we do the same ID check performed at your egg collection. So we show you the card, we ask you your name, your date of birth. If you're having treatment with a partner, your partner's name and date of birth. So then we'll discuss the quality of the embryo with you. And then we'll ask if you have any questions. So while the doctor prepares for the embryo to transfer, we would close the hatch door again and we will get ourselves organized. So while we are organizing ourselves, the doctor is checking on the ultrasound, inserting the catheter into the uterus under ultrasound guidance. And we would be doing another ID check inside the lab with your patient card and the dish containing the embryo or embryos that we're about to transfer. So when the doctor calls out ready, at that point, we start to load the embryo into the catheter. And you can see here, this is us loading the catheter. So we've got a, a long plastic tube with a syringe at the end that's creating suction. So she's using the little bit of suction to pull up a very tiny, a very small amount of media, the fluid with the embryo inside. And then that's going to be passed through the door, uh, through the hatch into the theatre to the doctor. So that's it loaded, comes out of the crib and into the hatch. So once we've passed that through, then you should see um, the catheter being passed through into the uterus on the ultrasound. So this ultrasound image down here, what you're looking for is the camera comes from the top. So the probe is on the abdominal uh, wall. So the probe is at the top. I can get my cursor reckon. The probe is up here. This is a full bladder. So it just helps us uh, make the transfer a little bit easier. This is the uterus down here. And this is the lining of the uterus in the middle. So this is the catheter, the white bit is the catheter coming all the way in and depositing this little block, this little white spot, and that's the embryo transferred on. So when the doctor has finished doing the embryo transfer, they would always hand the catheter back out to us. So we're going to check under the microscope to make sure that the embryo is gone. We will call out clear so that you know the embryo has been successfully deposited into the uterus. And that's the transfer complete. There's no sedation and no needles required. So this is a question that often comes up. So should we have a single embryo transfer or a double embryo transfer? And this is a decision best made with your doctor because they can take into account your history, your situation, and help you make the best decision for your case. <clears throat> but as an example, I can give you some quick statistics. So We'll take our, our pretend patient and we'll call her Jane. So Jane is 35 years old. Jane has two lovely blastocysts on day five. So if she has a single embryo transferred, her chance of pregnancy is over 50%. If she has a double embryo transfer, her chance of pregnancy with two embryos is maybe up to 60%. So the chance does increase, but it doesn't double. So if she gets pregnant, having transferred two embryos, she her chance of having a twin pregnancy is one in four. So one in every four ladies in this scenario will have will start out as a twin pregnancy. So twin pregnancies sound lovely in theory, but are riskier. They will miscarry more often and they will deliver early more often with potential complications for mother and babies. So given those risks, our patient Jane is statistically more likely to be able to take a baby home if she has her embryos transferred one at a time. So one fresh and one frozen. Chance of pregnancy with the one fresh is over 50%. Chance of pregnancy with one frozen is around 50%. So obviously this scenario needs to be discussed with the doctor at the time of consultation, but typically we recommend the transfer of a single embryo because we want to keep the chance of complications for everyone as low as we possibly can. And our ultimate goal is not just a positive pregnancy test. The ultimate goal is the baby to take up. So if there are other good quality embryos, then we can freeze them for subsequent cycles. So to successfully freeze embryos, what we actually have to do is we dehydrate them. So for example, if you've got your ice cube tray and you put water in it, you put it in the freezer. 
the ice, the, sorry, the, the water will expand slightly and it will form crystals. So the expansion and the crystal formation will damage embryos. So we dehydrate these embryos, we remove some of the fluid before we freeze them. So the process we use is called vitrification, which literally means like glass. So there's no crystal formation and the embryo is protected in a tiny little bubble of fluid, which freezes almost instantly. To freeze them, we use something that looks like this. So this is a high security straw. It's like a very tiny, skinny little drinking straw with an insert in it. This red thing is the insert to hold the embryo. And the embryo actually sits right in the tip and there is a gusher. So the embryo sits right in the gusher. So once we've loaded the embryo onto that gusher in the tip of the rod, we would put it into the straw, we would seal the end of the straw, and then we plunge the straw into liquid nitrogen. So this keeps the embryo at minus 196 degrees Celsius until it's ready to thaw. So these embryos that have been frozen do not develop and they do not degrade while they're frozen. So this, this photo here is one of the tanks that we have in, in the clinic. So each patient is given an address within a tank. So we know where every single embryo is in the building at any point in time. So for example, your embryos might be stored in Daisy, canister one, cane three. So Daisy is the name of the tank. Um, the canister is this metal bucket and the cane is these metal rods. If I can get my cursor over here, sorry there. Anyway, the metal rods, there we go. So the metal rods are uh, allocated to a single patient and they have a little goblet, a little, a little, um, little bucket on the bottom and all the embryos can be stored in there. So by freezing additional embryos, we increase the chances of success from a single stimulated cycle of treatment and the embryo survival rates from vitrifying embryos is over 96%. So the chances of pregnancy are almost as good as having fresh embryos transferred. So I'd like to talk a little bit about our PGT service. So PGT stands for pre-implantation genetic testing, and it involves taking a biopsy of a blastocyst, the day five embryo, before we even do a transfer. And we test it for the number of chromosomes it contains. So for example, we can test embryos to detect if it will be affected with Down syndrome or various other genetic conditions. So a small number of cells are removed and they're placed into a test tube and sent off for testing. This testing can check that all 23 pairs of chromosomes that are actually supposed to be present are there. And based on these results, your clinical team can determine which of the embryos that we've created are okay to use. So this extra testing and counting of chromosomes can give couples peace of mind, particularly if they've experienced multiple miscarriages or if they have genetic conditions that run in the family. The testing can be helpful as well because the embryo quality that we see as embryologists is no guarantee of chromosomal abnormality. We can tell you that the embryo looks lovely, but we have no idea what the number of chromosomes in the embryo actually are. So chromosomal abnormalities in embryos increase in accordance with female age. And we know that this is an important part of many patients' journey to get a healthy baby is this extra genetic testing. So the embryo you see here is a top quality blastocyst. We would biopsy five or six of the cells from the part of the embryo that's already hatching. And then we'd send that sample off for testing. So when we get a report back, we can see that the copies of the chromosomes here, where's my little cursor? So you can see the copies of the chromosomes here. And this embryo would have three copies instead of two of chromosome 16. So this would be referred to as trisomy 16, and that is a leading cause of miscarriage. So this embryo would not be suitable to be transferred. So at SimSwords, we're currently in the process of obtaining our license to perform this procedure, and we expect to be able to offer it to the patients within the next couple of months. So at SimSwords, we also run the Oncology Fertility Preservation Service for Ireland. Um, it's partially funded by the Department of Health and the rest we do fund ourselves. But the aim of this service is to provide fertility preservation services to people who've been newly diagnosed with cancer. So the patient needs a referral from their oncology service, ideally as soon as possible, um, and they need to be given a few weeks clearance. So that means that they can wait a couple of weeks before they need to start treatment. So typically 
these patients would be seen in SimSORs within a few days of their diagnosis. Um, and we do that because we understand the time sensitive nature of this condition. So as you can imagine, this is a really overwhelming time for these people. Um, and we do need to see them before their treatment starts because chemotherapy and radiotherapy can be very damaging to ovaries and testicles. Any surgical interventions can also be damaging, obviously if it involves the ovaries or the testes, or even if it's close to other uh, reproductive structures such as fallopian tubes or the nerves which control erection. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I think it's important to say here that some patients are not suited to fertility preservation. So if the oncologist can't give us that amount of clearance that we need, those couple of weeks that we need to perform the treatment, then it might happen that the patient's condition is so severe that they can't wait that amount of time and they must start their treatment immediately. Or in some cases, it's also that the actual fertility preservation might exacerbate their cancer. So such as the case, for example, with um, hormone driven breast cancer, so something like that. So we would always defer to the oncologist's professional opinion because they're trying to save someone's life rather than just saving their fertility. So first and foremost, we have to do no harm. So the consultation and agreement between the oncologist and the surgeon and the SimSwords team is vital in all of these cases. So for men who are seeking fertility preservation treatment, they need to have blood work done and then they can be booked in to provide us with a semen sample. So all of that can happen within sort of a week or two of their diagnosis. So we aim to freeze up to eight straws of semen. So when we do a sperm freeze, we would always thaw out one of those straws to make sure that the sperm has survived the freezing and the thawing. Um, so also we can inform the patient that the sperm has survived, but so that if we need to use it in the future, we know what to expect of the sample when we thaw it out. So we're usually left after we've frozen the eight, we've taken one to determine the survival, and then we're usually left with seven straws in storage. And what that would translate to usually would be seven different cycles of treatment if the patient needs to come back to use it in the future. So those straws can be kept in storage for as long as the patient needs it. The first few years are free of charge. Um, they will eventually be charged a storage fee depending on how long they choose to keep it in storage. And that's it. And these men can go back to their oncologist and start their treatment knowing that their fertility is preserved. So for the ladies seeking fertility preservation before oncology treatment, the process is a little more complex. So we require three to four weeks of clearance given by the oncologist, and that allows us time to stimulate the ovaries to produce the maximum number of eggs. So we collect the eggs as we've seen before, and we can either perform an egg freeze or an embryo freeze. So with an egg freeze, that would be appropriate if the lady is young or if she doesn't have a long-term partner, but if she is in a long-term relationship, she may decide to freeze embryos with her partner. So if the lady has a partner and chooses to freeze embryos because the survival rate of embryos is, oh, sorry, the survival rate and the pregnancy rate is better from frozen embryos than frozen eggs. So when the embryos are created, both partners then have a right to veto their use in future. So the consequences of freezing embryos could be that if the relationship breaks down, the part, one partner or the other partner may not uh, give consent to use it. So her reproductive material, she, she may lose access to be able to use it. I've, I've touched on this already, um, but egg freezing is becoming more popular in Ireland. So I just thought I'd, I'd mention it again. So ladies who plan to have children but haven't found the right partner yet, or if they're waiting for a better time to start their families, they may come to the clinic to freeze their eggs. And this is happening more and more often every year. So if you're considering freezing eggs earlier is always better. Um, and we would typically get more and better quality eggs from a 30 year old, say, than a 40 year old. So the process starts off the same way. We start with the IVF cycle, eggs are collected, and then the, the cumulus, the cloud of cells that we saw at the beginning, that's taken away, and we can tell which ones are mature. So the mature eggs are frozen on the same day as they're collected. So they're often frozen in small groups, usually between two and four uh, eggs on each straw. And that's because we almost always thaw them out all at once if the patient wishes to use them in future. So they can be inseminated with a partner's sperm in future or a donor if she wishes, and then embryos can be grown the same way as we've just discussed already. 
So we currently run a busy donor sperm service in the lab as well. So we order donor sperm every month from a company called Cryos and they're in Denmark. Um, so we would order for couples, we would order for single ladies, and we would order for same-sex couples wanting to have a baby. So couples would consider using donor sperm if the male partner has a very poor uh, same, uh, semen sample, if he has no sperm in his ejaculate at all, or if he carries a genetic condition that he doesn't want to pass on. Um, so Cryos in Denmark has a good selection of donors from varying backgrounds for the patients to choose from. And they're very reliable in terms of the quality of the samples that we get. So in Ireland, because it's such a small country, the use of individual donors is kept to a minimum. So there's usually only three families in the whole country using the same donor. So a quota system has been implemented so that if the, the quota of three families has already been reached, then we cannot order that donor any longer. So for this reason, we ask patients who are ordering donor sperm to give us their five top choices. So from that group, the lab will find which donor has the appropriate sperm quality, which has the right number of straws for us to be able to purchase, and who still has a quota available to be taken. And that's the visit to the lab. So listen, everybody, thanks for, for visiting us. And I hope you enjoyed your visit. And thank you for allowing me to show you around. I'll hand back to Aoife. And if you have any questions, feel free to get in contact with us. Oh, thanks so much, Mandy. Um, so we did have a few questions come through and um, some questions are a little bit more kind of specific to that person. So we're not going to be able to answer every question that comes in, but we'll do our best to, to answer them. Um, in full. So there was one here just around um, would sperm, I think he was saying um, if the sperm is tetrazoospermic, is this a huge barrier complication for IVF? To, to ratazoospermic? Yeah. Yeah, teratozoa spermic. So that's the, the sperm doesn't look very nice. So it, if, the, if the sperm is less than 4%, remember I, I mentioned 4%, we would consider normal. If it's less than 4%, we would consider ICSI to be the, the treatment of choice. So mm -hmm. the risk is that if we do IVF and we mix the eggs and the sperm together, the, the shape of the head of the sperm isn't able to penetrate through the egg to be able to fertilize it. So to bypass all of that, and the risk of, of getting failed fertilization, we would inject a single sperm into the mature eggs. Perfect. Um, yes, yeah, someone's asking about, but yeah, this is recorded, so you will be able to rewatch it. So that's no problem. And so day three versus day five transfer. This is yeah. kind of a common question. That was a common question. I, I actually should have put something in there about that. So vast majority of patients would have day five transfers and the reason that we grow embryos to day five is to choose between them. so between day one and day three all the embryo has to do is divide so it goes from a single cell into two cells into four cells into eight cells and all that's doing is it's, it's a very simple process for the for the embryo to go through now the complexity comes when we get to the end of day three day four day five and the creation of that blastocyst structure is more challenging for the embryo. So the, what we want to see when we're growing embryos to day five is we want to challenge them. We want to see which ones are the best quality, which ones are able to make that nice looking blastocyst structure. So if we do a transfer on day three, all we've just seen is a couple of cells dividing. So on day three, if you have a large group of embryos, they're all typically between sort of five, eight, 10, cells they're all typically still dividing and it's very difficult for us to choose which would be the best of that group so what we would like to do is to grow everything onto day five and by the time we get to day five those say if we had 10 good quality day three embryos you might end up with four or five good quality day five embryos so you get a drop off and there is for everybody there's a drop off between day three and day five and we want to see that that is typical of human embryology because it's showing us which is the strongest ones which are the ones that are able to make it to the blastocyst stage and from that cohort then on day five we can choose the best one the one that looks the nicest the one that has the best history if we've had it in the embryoscope we can see what how the division patterns have gone and choose the best one on day five so you would get better pregnancy rates from a single embryo transfer on day five than you would as a single embryo transfer on day three because we know that it is a, it is a strong enough embryo to be able to create a blastocyst. Perfect. 
Um, so someone's asking, would egg freezing be recommended for a young woman, 28, who has endometriosis? That would be probably a, a question to ask one of the clinicians, but typically, absolutely. Like yeah. if, if you're yeah. even considering it, come and have a talk to someone, the earlier the better. And yeah. one thing we do say, I, I don't think you're ever gonna regret freezing them. Mm. And if you want to use them in the future, great. If you don't need to use them in the future, you know, even better. But I don't think you'll ever regret freezing them in the first place. Yeah. And you Perfect. might regret not freezing them in, in future. 100%. Yeah. Um, there's a few questions there around asking about what qualifications <laughs> people are looking for um, for tra to become trainees. I would encourage you, if you want to just email communications at same study, and I can get you in touch with, with the lab team there. Um, because I think there's a few questions coming in through, which is great. Great to see people are interested in getting into the field. Come, come work with us. First, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I can tell you about my, my qualifications. So yeah. all of us in the lab have kind of come at this from a different angle. Personally, my qualifications, I did a um, a degree in medical science at university, and then I did a, a graduate diploma and a master's in clinical embryology. So this was 15 years ago. <clears throat> um, the, there weren't that many um, master's courses like that around, but now there are a good few more. I obviously did mine in Australia, um, but there's, I think there's a few now in the UK as well. So there's nothing in Ireland at the moment in terms of a master's in clinical embryology, but there are, I think, a couple in the UK. Perfect. Um, so how long does it typically take to get results from PGT testing? From PGT testing, so when we do the biopsy, we would typically send them off within the week. So we would sort of batch a few patients together and send them off all together. So they'd be sent off usually within the week and it takes about 10 days to two weeks for us to get results back. So when patients come through for PGT, they would be you know, booked in for a return consult a couple of weeks after they've had their cycle and we would have results back at that point for the doctors to discuss with them. Um, so this is a question that does come up a lot and it is kind of a difficult one to answer, but it's, it's, it's about like, what is the average number of IVF cycles that people generally have in order to get, you know, to, to, to get that positive pregnancy test? I know there is a that lot is, of variables. That, that is a hard one. Yeah, yeah, that is a hard one. So yeah. it's, 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 it's how long is yeah. people's been really? Yeah really depends yeah. on the situation. It depends on your obstetric history, your gynecological history, your you know, partner's um, medical history. And it, it depends how many children you want. You know, if, yeah. if you get a, a baby after one or two cycles and you want, you know, three or four kids, you know, how many, how many cycles does it take? Now, keep in mind when we do one stimulated cycle, a lot of patients will get frozen embryos from that cycle as well. So you don't necessarily have to go through all the stimulation, all the drugs every single time. So you would do it once. And luckily enough, a lot of patients get embryos to freeze as well. So if they have a pregnancy with that single embryo, terrific. And they can come back in a couple of years time. If they don't, they can come back within the next four to six weeks and have a frozen embryo transferred and they don't have to go through all the, all the hormonal injections and stuff every time. Hmm. Yeah, I don't think a lot of people realize that that actually you can have, you know, from one IVF cycle, you could actually have a huge amount of embryos from that. Whole so, family. You know, some yeah. some patients have had their whole family. They've had their, their three or four kids from a single cycle. So yeah. It just, it depends how your body responds to everything. And that, that, is, that is a question that doesn't really have one answer. I'm sorry. Exactly. No. <laughs> Um, I think I've answered, we've kind of gone through majority, like I said, if there, there's some ones that are a little bit more specific, um, that probably we wouldn't be able to answer on this forum. But like I said, I would encourage anyone to, to, to use the communications at same study email, and I'll pass on any, any questions to the team there and we can reach out directly to, to you guys Absolutely. there. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I'll check to see if any other ones. I yeah, know we answered that one. Mm, yeah, I think that's it for now. Yeah, I'll give it one more minute. See if there's anyone else that has any other queries. Um, but like I said, I can I can answer. We can answer some of these offline. Yeah, 
absolutely yeah. so if you think of anything you know this evening or in the next couple of days absolutely send um Aoife an email so her mm. email address is Aoife is it communications at sims communications. yeah communications at sims yeah perfect so um, send Aoife yeah. an email and she can get in contact with me and and we can help you there as well yeah um multiple yeah there was one around assisted hatching yeah um just a, maybe an explanation around that I know that's kind of one of the things that yeah was not really done on a regular basis or it's kind not of it's not typically done so what it is on day three of embryo development we would pop a little hole in that jelly shell that zona that's surrounding the set the, the egg the embryo so by popping a little hole in it it helps the embryo when it gets to the blastocyst stage to be able to hatch out so instead of expending a lot of energy and metabol um, metabolites to be able to push its way out of the of the zona we've already created a breach in there so it's easier for it to just push its way out or you know fall out um so we would do that if we think that the the zona is quite thick or if it feels particularly if we're injecting it, if it feels quite hard, we would recommend that for some patients. It doesn't happen very much anymore. Um, sometimes if we do a, a frozen cycle after the, the thaw, we would pop a little hole in the, in the, the zona if it's still quite thick, because we don't want an embryo that's just been frozen and thawed to then have to expend all this uh, extra energy to be able to push itself out of this zona. And it does need to push itself out before it's able to start the implantation process once it gets into the uterus. So just to save it the trouble, we would sometimes pop a little hole in the in the zona just to, to help it hatch out. Perfect. Now I learn something new every day. Um, <laughs> and someone's just asking, is PGT harmful in any way to an embryo? It's it's taking the biopsy of the embryo is I wouldn't say harmful, but it's not going to do it any favors. So if you don't have to do PGT, if you're not doing it for a specific reason or a good reason, then I would say don't do it because we're not going to improve its, its quality in any way by biopsying it. Having said that, the pregnancy rates, sorry, the survival rates first after biopsies are very good and the pregnancy rates after biopsy and freezing and thawing are also very good. So we're, we're not improving it. So if we don't have to do it, we don't want to do it. But if it's, if it's something that is important to taking home a healthy baby, then it's absolutely worth it. Perfect. No, thank you so much. Um, I think I'm going to, yeah, there's a few. Yeah, we will have the recording up on our YouTube channel and on the website as well. So there's no, no problem. If you follow our socials, I'll put a link. Um, so we'll probably have that posted um, later tomorrow afternoon. Um, so if you did miss any of the beginning of the, the presentation, you'll be able to catch it all tomorrow. Um, but yeah, no, I think I'm, we're going to finish up there. Like I said, if there's anything kind of, again, there's a few specific questions coming in there and, you know, we'd be happy to answer them. It would just be better if we uh, and answer them offline. So um, first of all, I want to thank all of you for, for attending tonight. Um, it's um, great to see the interest there. And I, I hope you, you, you learned some stuff today. I certainly did, even though I always learn stuff when I, I love these ones. I just love them. But um, so it was, it was, it was great. And thank you so much, Mandy. Um, Pleasure. Really thank you very much. Enjoy your evening. It. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.